Genesis chapter 1. We'll just start at the beginning tonight. Topic, no Satan. You can spell no any which way you want. K-N-O-W, because that's what we're talking about. But we're also saying no, N-O to him. No Satan. I don't know much about football, but I do understand that when teams are serious about winning games, that not only do they work hard out on the field in preparation, not only do they allow exercises in addition to all that, not only do they work on eating the proper foods and drinking all the best drinks to give them the highest energy, but they also spend a lot of relaxed time, that is non-physical time, in reviewing the videos of the opponents' games that they've had previously done. To see how they play, to see what kind of different passes they have, or how they run certain plays, and, and all the things that they do, so that they be able to, of course, stand up against their opponents and beat them. Now that's not anything probably of a surprise to you, but I just say that in, in mind as we think about who we're talking about as far as Satan and the reality that he exists. And the fact that it behooves us from time to time to remind ourselves not only about his existence, but also to remember uh, his plays, if you want to call it that. His conniving schemes and the things that Satan tries to do in defeating us. Because mind you, he knows your plays. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your life. So why am I starting with Genesis 1? Because that's kind of a good place to start when we think about what we're dealing with tonight. We introduce God in Genesis 1, or God introduces himself just by the very beginning of acknowledging his existence. In the beginning, God. And then it says, God, of course, created the heavens and the earth. You read the next uh, part here in verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light and that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So evening and morning, one day was one day, the first day. So here's God's introduction to us as we'll look at Genesis 1. We're looking at this and we're seeing God and we recognize as we, you can read the rest of it, not only does he create the world and, and put it into existence and create life, but all these little things in a proper succession, mind you, does he create these things? So he doesn't just create man and think, oh, man, I better put some, have a place to put him. You know how we do sometimes where you're carrying a heavy load into the house and you walk inside and you've got this burden, you look around, there's no place to put it because the table's already full. God didn't have his table full. He had everything fixed before he ever put man in the earth. He had light. He had sun. He had stars. He had food out there for him to put, to put man into existence. God, God's demonstrating in Genesis 1. His power, his wisdom, his majesty, and his purpose in all that's happening here. So, Genesis 1, we meet God, give a little introduction to him. Also, there's a bit of an introduction to man and his making as God talks about the things that he's made. And in verse 26, God says, let us make man in our image. That was God talking not to himself in the sense of how we might talk to ourselves, but the other parts of the Trinity. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them, that is mankind now, have dominion over the fish over the, of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And so God created man, mankind. Adam, they were starting with. So Adam now is introduced. A lot less than God, dependent on God. Now watch as things are coming along here, because we're seeing God always being, creating then everything else out of nothing and starting it into existence, giving it a plan and a purpose that it can continue on, that each would after its own seed produce after its own kind. So he starts the ball rolling, but after that, the plants, the animals, and all that continue on as God has set that. And then in verse 31 at the end of that chapter, it says that God saw everything that he made, and indeed it was very good. Now, as you're looking through what God has done, 
along the way, day by day, there's a pause at the end of each little section, and God said, we saw that, and it was good. Now, at the end of everything, God said, that's very good. So God saw that it was in very good, and so the evening and morning, and thus was the sixth day, and then after that, of course, the seventh, and God rest. Not that he was tired like we would get and need rest, but he paused from his work at that moment. Genesis chapter 2 is a retelling of that story of the, the making of man in a little bit more detail, a little more fashion, and then also Eve is introduced in there. Now, as she's introduced, she's introduced uh, being made different than man was made. Uh, let's glance at this for just a moment in chapter 2. Um, see, I've got to find my verse here. Now I've noted this. Uh, verse 18. Uh, and God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper, comparable or suitable for him, something like him, not like the rest of the world, but something more like man. And the woman is uh, not the same as man, but she's of mankind. But now God... Verse 19, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast, every bird of the air, he brings them at him, he names them. And verse 20, and then Adam gives names to all of them. And then there's a little comment at the end of verse 20. It says, but Adam, for Adam or for Adam, there was not found a helper, helper comparable to him. And a lot of times I'll remark at weddings about this, that there's a lot of things in the world that distract us, but nothing. That's comparable to having the right wife and the right husband, as God has set up a man. Then verse 21, Then the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and as he slept, he took one of the ribs and closed up his flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into the woman, and he brought her to the man. Now there's a little switch in what's going on here. God's using something that he's created and taken a part of that, he makes woman. A bit interesting. A fact that actually took place. You could say, well, this was the first surgery that was ever performed. And it was. And the first with anesthesia, if you'll notice there. Because he caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. As you're looking at all of these things, you're just seeing what's unfolding here. Now Genesis 3 starts. And this is what we're getting to when we talk about Satan here. Now the serpent. And you think, oh, wait a minute. Um, where did this come from? Now think about it for just a moment. We know as we start with God in Genesis 1, we're assuming, and God is assuming, that he's always there. And we see that in the beginning God. And then we see God making everything else. And so we're following the line of creation from chapter 1, a little more detail in chapter 2, and you get to chapter 3, and, and, and you've got man, by the way, in the garden uh, in the chapter 2. And he's tending the garden. He's meant to work, by the way, not just lay back and let God feed him in this whole process. And when you come to chapter 3, there's something different. And the serpent was more cunning than any beast. Why is that? exactly what there is in the connection here, other than we know what the serpent is being uh, used by, at least at this moment, as Satan himself. More cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat, you shall not eat, or, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. I just happened to be out watering my flowers yesterday in the front yard. Now, I might as well eat this little story, but there was a couple of them were about to die, so I was putting some water on them. That's about the extent of my farming ability. But I saw a snake, about five or six foot long. I still don't know what kind it was. I'm curious. Um... As I was watching it the whole time, that snake never turned around and talked to me. Now, had it talked to me, my first thought was, how do you talk? Here's this serpent having a discussion with Eve, and she's not 
not saying, hey, where did you learn to talk? And she's been around some period of time and seen all these animals and heard the cows and orchid and everything else you can imagine. But why in the world all of a sudden does animals, Barbara's just cracking up over here with my animal imitation, just, what, where does this serpent come off top of? And Eve just comes right back with an answer like she's expecting it to talk. You bet more cunning. More cunning. Okay. So as you go on here, the discussion goes between the serpent and Eve, and the serpent's throwing out the comment after, after it starts with a question, you know, can you eat from any tree? And Eve says, no, not this one over here. And then verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Blatant lie. I want you to notice that. If we talk about knowing Satan, number one, no, Satan lies. He should have known that Satan was lying. She said what God said. Satan says, no, it's over here. Now, Eve ought to stop and think, well, now, who do I trust here? Okay, this, this serpent over here that just come out of nowhere starting to talk to me, or God who I know created me? We've been talking, and he's been guiding, he's been directing, he's helping us to work through all of this stuff that they don't know about, and tending the garden, obviously God's given them some insight, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, a serpent starts talking, you're going to trust it more than God. And so as I'm listening to all of this going on, I've got to ask myself, why, as you know through the rest of the story, does Eve listen to Satan over God? Think about it. Because it's going to be a little bit of insight about you and me and mankind as a whole. Because we know what God's telling us in his scriptures. We know a lot of times, even when you just set that aside, we just know by what God has made us like in his image, the sense of ought that's inside us, that, that image of God that's there that knows there are things that we ought to do and things we ought not to do. And, and because we disobey either one way or the other, we, we don't do the things we ought to do, or sometimes because we do the things we ought not to do, we feel guilty. And yet in this whole process, God is not being listened to, but Satan is. Know how sharp Satan is to take the focus off God and present something in such a new way that you feel like you ought to listen to him. He's good. And that's what's said back in verse 1. Satan was more cunning than any beast of the field. He's sharp. Give him credit for what he does. He does it good. My theory. Two reasons that he listened to Satan. Number one, she wanted what he offered. As he goes on and talks in verse 5, after he contradicts God and saying you'll not surely die, verse 4, he said, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. And then the woman looks at the tree with a different viewpoint now. She looks at the tree and she saw it was good for food. That it was pleasant to the eyes. And the tree was desirable if it was really going to make you wise. I'm adding a little bit in here and paraphrasing. Desirable to make you wise. So she took the fruit and ate it. She stopped listening to God because Satan was telling her something she wanted to hear. You see what I'm saying? Because it tells us not only something about Satan, but about ourselves and how Satan knows how to approach us. So he's going to be along whispering in our ears because he knows you. He knows me. And he'll lead you astray by telling you something you want to hear that may not be right. Number two, I think part of the reason she listened to him is because it was so new she didn't know anything about Satan. And there's our downfall again, too. And that's why we're talking about knowing Satan. 
just understanding some basics out there about Satan. Now, I, you know, give her, uh, I guess, a little bit of credit here because she was brand new on the earth. And so how much do you know about Satan? You just met him, he's, he's talking to you, and it's, it's your first occurrence. But he's also lying. He's contradicting, contradicting what God says and planting thoughts in there to make her want something that wasn't good for her. So as we look at Satan, I can understand some things. So let's listen here about the next point here. Because Satan, as we're looking at what's going on here, will tell us mostly the truth. Mostly the truth. It'll be sprinkled with just enough lie to be poisonous for you. But it'll have enough truth that it will sound good and right and delectable, I guess you could say. It's the lie part that gets us. He's cunning. He's described as the father of lies by Jesus Christ himself. As Jesus now is taking on the hypocrites of his day and time in the New Testament. And when he does, he talks to them and he says, your father, Satan is a liar and has been a liar since the very beginning. God's been watching him. I think also in the process, he's going to act like he cares for you. Think about it. Here's Satan out there hanging around a tree or wherever he's at on the ground, standing up, I guess, because he doesn't crawl on his belly till after the condemnation here. And, and, and as he's doing whatever he's doing, he comes along and he says, hey, Eve, you're really missing out on something. Like, I care for you. Boy, wouldn't you like to have that? Why does he even care? All the other animals are walking by and just doing their own thing. Their, their old snake over here, he's watching out for my cause. That's what it seems like. So think about what Satan does. Who you are. How he presents it. There's going to be some truth in it. There might be a lot of truth, but there's going to be just enough that will take you down. And in, in this whole process of things, he'll look like he's doing something good for you. That if you'll just listen, he's got a better way of doing this. He will give you more than what God gives you. As you look at the tree here, God's holding back on you. And boy, does that not hit our society. If you follow Christianity, you lose. If you just push God aside and do things your own way, you win. That, that's what our world is telling us. And a lot of people in this country and around the world have bought it, hook, line, and sinker. And they're being reeled in by Satan. Number one, Satan is a liar, but he will tell you mostly the truth. Number two, he is bold. Now, I guess it doesn't take a lot of boldness to happen to walk up or however he got around in Genesis 3 and talk to Eve and convince her to what to do. But I'm marking down as bold in the passage that was read just a little earlier in Job chapter 1. And Miss Harrison was reading here, and you remember the story now, it just talks about that it says that God was basically having a meeting with the angels. And it said, and Satan came into the meeting. Well, I guess if he's the fallen angel, he knows where they meet. Maybe he knows the regular schedule that they meet. Knows how to get in and where to go, and, and so he just shows there's nothing more that you could describe of a fish being out of water than Satan showing up at a meeting with God's angels. Who gives you the audacity to walk into God's presence? And not only does he do it, he comes walking in like, hey, I'm in charge around here and I'd like to get some answers. And God has a discussion with him. Where you been, Satan? Ah, uh, you know, I've been walking around the earth. Boldness. And so God throws out to Satan. Have you thought about my servant Job? Oh, Satan's thought about it. He knows all about him. He's, he's describing or discussing with God. You, you built a hedge around him. You give me something to try on him, and I, I can take him down. He knows Satan. I regret, excuse me. He knows Job. He knows God. He knows how to do all this. The boldness of Satan is just so incredible. It just it's confounding. Now couple that with what happens in Matthew chapter 3 when we move to the New Testament. First book of the New Testament. As Jesus is just about to begin his ministry. And it says that a spirit 
leads him off into the wilderness. And as he's doing so, chapter 4, I'm double checking myself as I was thinking through when you came up. As he's doing so, Satan's right there. And Jesus is going off to pray. And he's fasting and his whole time. And Satan's right there behind him. Let's see if we can take down the son of God, Satan says. Let's go after the big fish. Had he done so, all the praying, all the worshiping, all the church going that we could do would be for naught. Because Jesus had sinned one time. Being man, he had that capability. Was tempted, the Hebrew author says, in every way, every way, like us. But without sin. Satan was tempted in every way you can imagine. Now, chapter 3, or chapter 4, rather, in Matthew starts with some basics, but it doesn't stop there. Another gospel writer talks about the fact that when Satan left him and the angels came and ministered, he said it left him for a season. That's the way Satan works, you know. He, you, you can maybe win a couple times, he'll let you win. Build a little confidence. But just for a while, because he's coming back. And he'll bring back more friends and more power and more thoughts and more connivance than he could ever imagine. No Satan in hold. So bold, matter of fact, you turn to the second last book of the Bible. I believe it has about 25 verses in it, the book of Jude. And there's a discussion mentioned here of something that goes back to the time of Moses in the Old Testament. And just reading along through Jude and all this New Testament stuff, all of a sudden you stumble on something between Michael and Archangel and Satan, and it has to do with Moses. Strange thing here. He's talking about people who defile with his flesh and speak evil of dignitaries. In verse 9 it says, Yet Michael the Archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed 